Rachel Barbeau here with Sunday Soul. So excited to be back with you. And you know why I do this show every Sunday? It's to give you that Sunday feeling, that nap in the recliner, that fresh out of church feeling, that Sunday brunch where, you know, that, that feeling where you have a conversation with somebody and you just get them. You get them from the very moment that you meet them. And my next guest, I can say that through and through, uh, from the moment I met him, I just felt his spirit, and I got him, and he is the head coach of Maryland, the Maryland football team, Coach Mike Loxley. Coach Lox, how are you? I'm doing great, Rachel. How are you on this Sunday? Yes. I like yes. that. I kind of like the vibe with it. I, I sit here when I heard you describing this show, uh, kind of put me back into that mindset and, and got me out of the the everyday grind of trying to figure out COVID and run a football team. So I'm looking forward to doing it. I was just telling your amazing assistant, she's awesome. I was like, Some, something that helps me stay grounded during this time when I start to feel overwhelmed, coach, is I say, Rachel, everybody in the world is in this same storm. We may not be in the same boat, but we're in the same storm. Nobody has a leg up. Nobody's, nobody's going, I got it. I've been here before. How are you, what's that self-talk? Because so much of, of what you do, and we're going to get into it with Maximize, and what I do and being a part of your program is that self-talk. How does Coach Locks talk to himself and motivate himself during these uncertain times? You know, it, it really starts with what you just kind of talked about. The, the basis and the foundation of my life is I'm at this point in my life where I like to say I'm on the back nine of my career and the back nine, I just turned the big five zero proud of it. Um, but for me, it's, you know what, let's attack today and handle today based off of whatever the rules are for today. Because again, as a coach, when you're in charge of uh, 120 kids and 30 staff members and, and you got a family at home uh, trying to, you know, navigate the uncertainty that goes along with our, where we are as a society, not knowing what tomorrow brings, the different rules that come along with as we get more information on whether it's COVID or the social injustices and things that are going on. I, I, I just love it. it really simplifies and makes it takes away that angst when I can just say, what are the rules for the day and let's attack today and I'll deal with tomorrow tomorrow is the old adage that uh, you know, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow doesn't matter. Today is a gift. So it's a present. Let's live in the present. And that's kind of what I try to do. And it's the only thing that kind of calms my nerves because every time I kind of get into uh, next week, I wonder what is going to happen. What do I have to do? Set schedules. And then something changes. It just creates a little more anxiety. So I say I'm going to wake up and whatever the rules are for today, I'm going to execute it based on today's rules and, and make the most out of it. Coach, tell me about the um, hourglasses that you have that are all over uh, your office. Uh, I'm sure they're at home. Tell me a little bit about those and tell our, our, our viewers a little bit about those hourglasses. Yeah, it's uh, it, it was a tough lesson that I learned. Um, I was one of those guys that you and I would be doing this, this, uh, this Zoom right now and I would be thinking about uh, 30 minutes from now and I've got a team meeting and I've got to write notes down. And so I would be probably not as in tune to just this conversation and completely into it. And I call it the lack of respect for time. I, I really had a lack of respect for time because you always take for granted that, you know, you got as much time as you need and, you know, it, it, I'll make time. Well, you know, as you know, losing my son Miko in 2017, uh, it was the first wake up call for me because it was the closest uh, that I felt from death in terms of, you know, losing a child. I mean, it doesn't get any harder than, you know, parents aren't built to bury their children. And so it really brought into some, brought to me some pers uh, perspective that I really took time for granted. I, I assumed that I would be here. I would have a chance to see him get married, see his kids grow up. You just assumed and took it for granted. And so, uh, when I lost Miko, I, I wanted to have reminders everywhere that time is the most valuable commodity we have. I mean, it's worth more than any amount of money I can make coaching. Uh, it's worth any amount of uh, valuables I have. 
time is just such a valuable commodity that I hate the fact that it took me so long to realize the value of it. And so you now I have reminders all throughout my office at home where I just had these hourglasses and, you know, sometimes I turn them over and, you know, just kind of watch it and understand that that's life. Every day you better live it to your fullest. You better maximize every single second of the day, whatever conversation, whatever you're doing at that time, be fully engaged in it and embrace it and love it, cherish it because it's not a guarantee. And it took me losing me to realize that the, the value of it and, and so I just have reminders of it around. So that's what the hourglasses are all about for me. What do you, now, you know my story, um, but as somebody, I, I haven't lost a child because I don't have children yet, but I've lost two parents and an ordinate amount of people in the past five, seven years, just grief upon grief. Um, I have my own thoughts, but I'm curious what you wish people knew about grief. Oh man, I think the first thing is, is that everybody does it in their own kind of way. Mm -hmm. For some reason, we have this thought or belief that everybody goes through the same emotions. And, you know, I even look at the, the small, uh, small sample size of my family, you know, I have three other kids, myself, my wife, and how each of us managed and, and continue to manage and deal with the loss of a brother, a sibling, or a, a you know, a child for Kia and I, and everybody does it in their own kind of way. And it's no one stop fix for it. And everybody gets through it in their own time. Mm -hmm. And they deal with it. For me, it was go back to work the next day, because it was a safe haven uh, for Kia. It was volunteering at a juvenile facility where she taught yoga down in Tuscaloosa uh, every Tuesday, because uh, it was a Tuesday or uh, when, she, when we when he, we found out per se, uh, if for, for Kai, it's dedicating his, you know, senior year. And uh, when he was national player of the year in junior college, it, that year that he passed. And, you know, for Corey, I think it was just even, you know, she dealt with the injuries of back-to-back uh, -back ACLs and knowing that never give up because, you know what, uh, Meek wouldn't. And so we all used it and we all had to, deal with it in our own individual way. And as a parent, you want to just make everybody happy. And as the father and the leader of the family, I wanted to try to be there for each and every one of them. But you know what, we each had to learn and to deal with it and, and how to come to grips with it in our own special way. You know, coach, I, I feel like one of the lessons I've learned is, um, and I try to tell people this, I feel like people around you don't want to upset you. So then they don't talk about your person, right? Yeah. And they, they, they don't wanna make you cry or make you upset. And I have to, it's almost like I'm screaming up and down in my soul. I wanna talk about my mom. I wanna talk about my dad. Because if I don't talk about them, their memories die, their spirit dies. Let's talk about them. Do you feel that same way or do you feel differently with your son, Miko? No, so he's always at the forefront of my thoughts. I use him in examples with our team, and uh, I, I talk about him quite a bit. You know, I got my phone right here, and as soon as my phone cuts on, I got a picture of him smiling. So <laughs> it's almost like sometimes when I look at it, it's like I almost lose a breath because I'm like, it hits me that, that he's not here. So um, he's always at the forefront of my thoughts, um, and, and so – me talking about it and me dealing with it, this is how I heal. And I'm not afraid to talk about it with my team. And, uh, you know, the, obviously here at Maryland, we dealt with our own tragedy uh, where the year before I took over, they lost a brother, uh, Jordan McNair, who passed away uh, here. Uh, and, and so we all kind of have uh, forged this relationship through the tragedies that we faced uh, to create and continue to develop this this tightness, this closeness that you need to have if you want to have a successful uh, football family. So talking about it for me is, like you said, it's healing. Um, I do know that people probably get uncomfortable or, or if all of a sudden if his name comes up, they look to see kind of, and, you know, I do my crying at night by myself. And, you know, I find my time to, 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 to deal with it when I do have a, a bad day, um, but I have no problem with 
using the energy that he brings for me to, to again, maybe make an impact on another kid in my program or somebody outside of my program that I can maybe impact by talking about it. But that's the thing. You just hit the nail on the head. You are. You're normalizing young men in your program and young women being able to show their emotions. And you know, with, with my movement, obviously visiting with you uh, in Maryland, and then the first time we met when I, I was at Alabama, normal, you normalizing it and saying, hey, guys, kings, it's okay to grieve. It's okay to show it. It's okay to talk about it. That's taking off the proverbial mass. That's destroying this idea of false masculinity. So you are a coach. You don't know. You'll never know, probably until you get to heaven, what young man you truly, 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 like the, the depth and breadth of it that you have impacted just by being vulnerable. No, that's uh, that I've never, I've not looked at it this way, but hearing you and have heard your uh, talk on a couple of different occasions at Bama and then bringing you here to Maryland uh, definitely shines the light on it, that it's okay. And uh, I think being vulnerable is a, a great aspect of leadership. Yeah. Uh, I think people respect you a little bit more and, uh, they're a little more, it makes it a little easier for them to be open and honest in their communications with you. I'm huge on being transparent, uh, sometimes uh, to a fault where, you know, I, I don't like to kind of BS. I kind of want to rip the, the, the Band-Aid off and let's yeah. get to the root of the issue and the matter. And, uh, you know, but definitely having you come speak to our team on a couple of different occasions, I know that's kind of opened up uh, a lot of people's eyes on, the, the, the masculine view of what is what being a man is all about. But to me, being vulnerable is part of being a man and being able to have emotions and, and, and be in tune and in touch with them. You were talking about outside your program. I read somewhere that you and Jordan McNair's father have an incredible bond as well. Would you share that with us? Yeah, you know, Marty McNair, Jordan's dad. Uh, it's funny, my daughter went to high school with Jordan. They were in the same graduating class so on signing day when she signed with Auburn. He was signing to come to Maryland to play football. And so I, I've known Marty uh, even prior to and kind of started the recruiting process on Jordan to Maryland when he was a ninth grader. But I can remember being at Alabama and when I heard of the tragedy of Jordan, one that he was uh, in the hospital and then when he passed away, uh, it just brought back some of those emotions because it was liter literally maybe six, seven months after Miko had passed. And uh, something in my soul said, call, call Marty. And so mm -hmm. I called Marty and, and the day Jordan passed and almost became a, a mentor for him in terms of uh, what he needed to do, um, how he needed to go about it, uh, burying his child. And, you know, I shared with him the emotions that, you know, I, I was, it was like an out of body experience with me being at the funeral. I just remember so many people coming up, but I just, I don't remember faces. I just kind of saw almost like a blank people. Like I, I yep. was in a whole nother world. Um, and then when I got home, I just broke down. It was a couple of days before I could even pull myself up. And I explained that to him and told him what I went through and used my experiences to maybe help his experience and you know he and I are great buddies uh my wife Kia actually just joined their foundation the Mc Jordan McNair Foundation uh to bring awareness to uh, heat stroke Marty just published a book that I wrote a uh, wrote a little uh excerpt in for him um he's my cigar buddy we kind of we, we uh we help each other it's a as I like to say it's a terrible fraternity to be a part of but we're making the best of it as two males that have buried children and, and, and we've become really a lot closer because and through the tragedies that we've experienced. Hey coach, I, I would imagine, um, you were telling me about your kids, right? Yep. And I would imagine um, you talked about grief and it being different for each one, but Kai and Corey and Mike Jr. I'd imagine the grief is, is unbearable for a sibling, right? To, to bury a sibling. But also, um, there, there's got to be somewhere in there where there's like, I'm here, right? I'm here. And we've lost him, but I'm here. So I, I want to just give you an opportunity to brag on your kids. Because I saw a post that you made on Kai the other day and some of the stuff he did. And I just want to give you an opportunity to brag on these amazing kids that you have. Yeah, you know, obviously, uh, having four and 
you know, Mike Jr. obviously being the oldest. I've got two grandsons that are uh, Mason and Milo, so they're keeping the Loxley name. We've got another generation of Loxleys coming through, and they're uh, seven and three years old, and uh, right here in the D.C. area. So the benefit of being back home and coaching here at Maryland has afforded me the opportunity to be back closer and get around my grandkids a little bit more and having them over on those Sundays. You know, they like to come over and swim on Sunday. So, you know, Mike, again, you know, was the oldest. He played for me at Illinois, was part of our Rose Bowl team. And, and now just to see him with his two sons, kind of the rewarding thing for me is when I, he says to me, Pop, I, now I know why you used to be on me all the time because Mason <laughs> is just like what you <laughs> – I'm on him like you were on me. So it's great to, to see him be a dad and, and the time he's investing in his kids. And obviously, you know, being a coach and raising kids, I, I wasn't as fortunate to have that time as much as he does. But it's great to see that, you know, with Kai, uh, the, the youngest of the boys, uh, I say he and I are a lot more same, the same than we're different which kind of makes that relationship kind of uh, tough sometimes because we are <laughs> very, very similar. But, you know, just to see the things he's gone through, um, you know, he and Miko were really, really close. Uh, you know, when it happened, you know, he had left Texas. He signed with Texas, left there, went to junior college for a year. And, you know, the year Miko passed away, he was uh, dedicated that season and ended up being named the National Junior College Player of the Year. Wow. Uh, finished up at uh, UTEP. Probably not the type of career in, ending that he wanted there at UTEP. Didn't have a lot of success uh, winning um, there and, and probably struggled a little bit just playing quarterback and finding his way. And, I, you know, because he's one of the ones that that mask we talk about, I, I don't know if he's taken it off yet to show his vulnerability. But mm -hmm. um, big-time athlete has opportunities. going to be, you know, going down to try out with Houston Texans. And, you know, fortunately, he's going to get an opportunity to try out with them. And, Hopefully, see if see if he's able to prolong his career. But uh, I was excited when I when I heard him say that if the football thing didn't work out, that he thought about maybe doing law school. So he just graduated, earned his degree from UTEP, and so forth. We threw a little graduation uh, drive by where people can come by. Obviously, with COVID, uh, not being able to uh, to celebrate a, the the he's the, the the next Loxley to earn a degree. I was the first in my family and. Wow. And now he's the first to, as the, the baby to finish it and did it and completed it, even though he's been through a lot. So really proud of that. And then Corey, you know, every dad's got to have a, a daddy's girl. And you know, <laughs> she is, uh, she's the best athlete in the house. And they all get pissed when I say it, but it's true. <laughs> and unfortunately, she went to the other school in Alabama. Uh, I think she did it just to kind of piss me off. But no, you know, she had. War Eagle, by the way. Exactly. I can only imagine that you would say that. But, uh, you know, the, the, the year Miko passed, she had just tore her ACL the Wednesday before he passed. And so, you know, she struggled with that. Then the very next year, she missed the whole season and she tore the other ACL. And so she missed two straight years. But then last year had a, a great year. She made it through healthy. She scored some goals. Uh, she was their comeback player of the year there. I was there for the banquet this spring before COVID hit to see her get the award as the uh, kind of the comeback player of the year for, for their team and expect big things out of her this year for them if they're able to play. So, you know, they're all doing wonderful. They're all great kids. I'm really proud of how they carry the Loxley name. So, you know, let's get to brag on them a little bit. And it, they, they all wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Kia. So I gave Kia all the credit. Yes. So I'm the I'm the Disney dad. I'm the guy that goes away for six months and shows back up with gifts and and acting like everything is perfect. 